In 1877, a Boston fortune teller named Sarah Howe, frustrated with American women's economic opportunity being entirely tied to who they married, had a plan. She would create the first bank run entirely by women for women, the Ladies Deposit Company. But this was no ordinary bank. Not only did it break down social barriers, but it offered an unimaginable return rate of 8%, with promises that investors could earn nearly double their money by the end of the year. A bank for a woman that performed better than any bank ever founded by a man? It sounded too good to be true. And that's because it was. Sarah Howe collected between $250,000 to $500,000, about six to $12 million today, before it all came crashing down. On September 25, 1880, the Boston Daily Advertiser exposed Howe's bank as a fraud, a Ponzi scheme nearly half a century before the infamous Charles Ponzi would even think to pull off a scam so great that we would instead name the term after him. Sarah Howe, Charles Ponzi, Bernie Madoff, Enron, WorldCom, Theranos? What is the common denominator here? For as long as there have been industries, there have been scams and the grifters that peddle them, especially in changing times where new and exciting technological or societal developments promise opportunity and a new way of life that are always just around the corner. This is especially true with one of our time's most revolutionary technologies, blockchain. Open source, anonymous, fast, decentralized, and entirely digital, the technology that powers everything we love about blockchain is also its greatest curse, attracting the likes of fraudsters, scammers, and any other sort of bad actor like moths to a flame. In 2021 alone, scammers took home around $14 billion in crypto-related fraud. Next to volatility, it's the space's largest economic risk factor. It's as synonymous with cryptocurrencies as is massive gains and never-before-seen use cases, and it's been there from the very beginning. This is the story of Bitcoin's very first exchange and its first major scam. One whose epic rise and colossal fall still ripples through the market to this very day. This is the story of Mt. Gox. Welcome back. We have the dollar, Japan has the yen, and the internet, it has the Bitcoin. On January 9th, 2009, a person known only to the world as Satoshi Nakamoto quietly released an obscure digital product that would revolutionize the world as the first decentralized digital currency, Bitcoin. The creator's identity is still unknown to this day, but word of his new invention would very quickly start to get around. A lot of people were very excited about the idea, but there was just one question. How do we get Bitcoin? This was nothing like the crypto ecosystem we know today. In the months after its release, there was no infrastructure to buy or sell Bitcoin. No markets, no exchanges, nothing. What good would be a digital currency if no one could use it? There were some crypto exchanges that were being worked on at the time, but they were only in testing mode. There was really only one verifiable way to get access to Bitcoin, and that was through mining a process where users can dedicate their computers to processing advanced hashing algorithms that validate the blockchain. In exchange, they earn newly minted Bitcoins as a reward. It's called proof of work, and it's foundational to how the Bitcoin network validates transactions and functions without any centralized authority. If a user didn't want to or couldn't mine Bitcoin, they had to find someone who would sell them Bitcoins directly in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion. Well, in February of 2010, a popular forum for Bitcoin called Bitcoin Talk created a portal called Bitcoin Market, in which Bitcoins could be bought and sold from person to person using payment systems such as PayPal, becoming one of the first known places where the purchase and sale of Bitcoin could take place. But it wouldn't take long for PayPal to stop offering support for the Bitcoin market due to rampant fraud, with many users claiming that they never received anything in exchange for what they had paid for their Bitcoins. So the project would dissolve just around a year later. Out of a tremendous need for something more trustworthy and less controlled by corporations, the first true Bitcoin exchange would launch on July 18th, 2010, Mt. Gox. It was one of the first websites to provide retail investors an opportunity to create a wallet and purchase Bitcoin. Founded by programmer Jed McCaleb, Mt. Gox domain was actually purchased in 2006, three years before Bitcoin was even invented, with a totally different purpose in mind. To build an exchange for users of the popular game, Magic the Gathering Online. In fact, that's literally what Mt. Gox stands for, Magic the Gathering Online Exchange. Yeah, the name wasn't just some made-up national park location. 
it was an acronym. Though, the project would never take hold and subsequently shut down only three months later. McCaleb would reuse the domain to advertise a card game he developed himself, but as news about Bitcoin began spreading, particularly through various niche online communities, he realized the need and potential for a website to trade Bitcoin with regular currencies. So, after enough time putting it all together, McCaleb would take what was once his video game and card game website and turn it into the world's first ever Bitcoin exchange. Little did he know just how much history was about to change. The first Bitcoin trade on Mt. Gox saw Bitcoin trading for 5 cents, with 20 Bitcoin at around 99 cents. But over the next year, Bitcoin would shock the world with its first 1000x rise. Though, McCaleb wouldn't be a part of Mt. Gox to see it. In March of 2011, he would sell the company entirely to a French developer named Marc Carpelis. McCaleb would later go on to co-found successful crypto projects, Ripple and Stellar, with Ripple coming across its own controversies and regulatory battles later on. The sale to Carpelis is where the trouble for Mt. Gox began. Mark Carpelis, also known by his online alias, Magical Tux, spent most of his developing career based in Tokyo, Japan. He also helped found the Bitcoin Foundation in 2012, an organization dedicated to the standardization and promotion of Bitcoin, serving on its own board until February of 2014. Carpelis arguably bought Mt. Gox at the right time. On April 13th, 2011, Bitcoin was trading for about $1, but by June, it traded at a high of nearly $30, a gain of 2,960% within three months. Bitcoin was getting hot and the world outside of this little corner of the internet was starting to take notice, all with Mt. Gox as a pioneer and leader in the centralized exchange marketplace, which was rapidly accelerating the unparalleled rise of Bitcoin. However, only a week after hitting its groundbreaking high, the problem started. On June 13th, 2011, the Mt. Gox exchange reported that 25,000 Bitcoin were stolen from 478 accounts. Four days later, the Mt. Gox's user database was leaked and put on sale, with more account thefts reportedly continuing throughout the day. Then the following week, a stream of false trades crashed the price of a Bitcoin to one penny when a hacker allegedly used credentials from a Mt. Gox auditor's computer to transfer a large amount of Bitcoins to himself and then selling them. Within minutes, the price corrected, but not without the incident impacting many accounts, which collectively lost around $8.7 million. In response, Mt. Gox sought to instill faith in the exchange by proving they still had control of the Bitcoins, moving 424,242 Bitcoins from a cold storage wallet, which is a crypto wallet not connected directly to the internet, but instead connected directly to a Mt. Gox address. By October, two dozen transactions appeared that sent a total of 2,609 Bitcoin to invalid addresses. As no private key could ever be assigned to them, these Bitcoins were essentially lost. While the standard client would check for such an error and reject the transactions, nodes on the network would not, exposing a weakness in the protocol. The integrity of the Bitcoin network was not impacted, but the incident would erode public confidence, sending the value down to $2 and sparking the first of many debates within Bitcoin's decentralized governance structure. But that didn't stop Bitcoin, nor Mt. Gox. Before they knew it, the site would grow to a point where it was handling over 70% of the world's Bitcoin trades, becoming the world's largest and leading Bitcoin exchange. In February of 2013, Mt. Gox would team up with the American-based Bitcoin exchange company CoinLab to help them access a U.S. customer base. However, by May 2nd, CoinLab would file a $75 million lawsuit against Mt. Gox, alleging a breach of contract. The lawsuit sparked the intervention of Uncle Sam. On May 13th, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security issued a warrant to seize money from Mt. Gox's U.S. subsidiary account with payment processor Juwala. Between May and July, the DHS ended up seizing over $5 million from Juala. In response, Mt. Gox suspended the withdrawal of US dollars, with the Tokyo-based Mt. Gox receiving pressure from Japanese banks to close its account. By July, Mt. Gox formally announced that it had fully resumed withdrawals, but as the month passed, most of the user requests to withdraw US dollars had still not been completed, left open with no way to access their Bitcoin or the dollars they were trying to withdraw. Mt. Gox cited they had discovered significant losses from crediting deposits that hadn't actually cleared, so they announced to the wary Mt. Gox user base that new deposits would no longer be credited until the fund's transfer was fully completed, further slowing down the use of the exchange. 
Wired Magazine reported in November of 2013 that customers were experiencing delays of weeks to months in withdrawing cash from their accounts. The article said that the company had effectively been frozen out of the U.S. banking system because of its regulatory problems. A substantial number of users claimed they were never able to withdraw their assets. The problems would only continue to mount. On February 7th of 2014, all Mt. Gox withdrawals were halted, with the company citing, a bug in the Bitcoin software makes it possible for someone to use the Bitcoin network to alter transaction details to make it seem like a sending of Bitcoins to a Bitcoin wallet did not occur when in fact, it did occur. Since the transaction appears as if it had not processed correctly, the Bitcoins may be resent. Mt. Gox is working with the Bitcoin core development team and others to mitigate this issue. The weeks went by and the withdrawals had still not resumed. The company published another press release indicating the steps it claimed it was taking to address security issues. In an email interview with the Wall Street Journal, CEO Mark Karpeles refused to comment on increasing concerns among customers about the financial status of the exchange, did not give a definitive date on which withdrawals would be resumed, and wrote that the exchange would impose new daily and monthly limits on withdrawals if and when they were resumed. By the 20th, with all the withdrawals still halted, Mt. Gox issued yet another statement, not giving any date for the resumption of withdrawals. A protest by two Bitcoin enthusiasts outside Mt. Gox headquarters in Tokyo began. Citing security concerns, Mt. Gox moved its offices to a different location. The price of Bitcoin on Mt. Gox dropped to below 20% the average market price, reflecting the growing sentiment and fear of the unlikelihood of Mt. Gox giving its customers their money. On February 23rd, 2014, Mt. Gox CEO Mark Karpeles resigned from the board of the Bitcoin Foundation. The same day, all posts on the company's Twitter account were removed. The next day, Mt. Gox suspended all trading and hours later, its website went offline, returning to a blank page. A leaked alleged internal crisis management document claimed that the company was insolvent after having lost 744,408 bitcoins in a theft which went undetected for years. Following the closure, Mt. Gox reported on its website that a decision was taken to close all transactions for the time being. Mark Karpelis told Reuters that Mt. Gox was at a turning point. All this Mt. Gox drama saw the market-wide price of Bitcoin dropping by 36% throughout the month. By February 28, 2014, Mt. Gox had filed for bankruptcy protections, reporting $65 million in liabilities. The company claimed it had lost nearly 750,000 of its customers' bitcoins and around 100,000 of its own bitcoins, worth around $473 million at the time. The company believes there is a high possibility that the bitcoins were stolen, blamed hackers, and began a search for the missing bitcoins. The chief executive of Mt. Gox said technical issues opened up the way for fraudulent withdrawals. Lawsuits from customers against Mt. Gox also began mounting. On March 9, 2014, Gox filed for bankruptcy protections in the U.S. as well. Later that month, the company claimed that they had found almost 200,000 bitcoins, worth around $116 million in an old wallet. It was around that time that a security company in Tokyo reported that they believed most of the missing bitcoins had actually been stolen straight out of the Mt. Gox wallet over time starting in 2011. Mark Karpelis was arrested in August 2015 by Japanese police and charged with fraud and embezzlement and manipulating the Mt. Gox computer system to increase the balance in an account. This charge was not related to the missing 650,000 bitcoins. After he was interrogated, Japanese prosecutors accused him of misappropriating $2.6 million in bitcoin deposited into their trading accounts by investors at Mt. Gox and moving it into an account he controlled approximately six months before Mt. Gox failed in early 2014. Leading many to think that the whole troubled history, from the very first instances of missing or stolen bitcoins, were all nothing more than a skimming scheme, presumably conducted by Mark Karpelis. The legal battle would play out in courts over the next eight years. In May of 2016, Mt. Gox creditors claimed a loss of $2.4 trillion and asked the funds to be paid to them, but Japanese authorities had only been able to track down $91 million worth of assets since first starting the investigation. Three years later, on March 14, 2019, the Tokyo District Court found Karpelis guilty of falsifying data to inflate Mt. Cox's holdings by $33.5 million, for which he was sentenced to 30 months in prison, suspended for four years, meaning he will serve no time unless he commits additional offenses over the next four years. 
The court acquitted Carpolis on a number of other charges, including embezzlement and aggravated breach of trust, based on its belief that Carpolis had acted without ill intent. Nonetheless, the verdict said Carpolis had inflicted massive harm to the trust of his users, and there was no excuse for him to abuse his status and authority to perform clever criminal acts. Carpolis issued a statement saying he was happy to be judged not guilty on the more serious charges and were discussing how to proceed with his lawyers regarding his conviction on the falsifying data charge. This takes us just to the end of 2021. At a creditor's meeting on October 20th, it was announced that a proposed civil rehabilitation plan was accepted by 99% of the creditors who were victims of the Mt. Gox fiasco, which ordered billions of dollars in Bitcoin would be provided as compensation. The plan was officially approved by Tokyo courts on November 16th, with a large payout of Bitcoins being planned for Q1 and Q2 of 2022. There are some who believe this kicked off the late 2021, early 2022 price dips, with many holding the belief that the victim creditors of this exchange are eager to sell. Bitcoin has changed the world, and the cryptocurrency revolution has really only begun. Marred by scammers, filled with eccentrics, and a chaos not typically seen in traditional finance, at least not as out in the open, Bitcoin's story will always be one of the unfathomable rags to riches tales, get rich quick failures, and unfortunately, fraudsters. The fact that its very first real exchange ended up being nothing but a scam is something that shouldn't be ignored, but it also shouldn't take Bitcoin or the entire crypto space with it. Based on its historicity and nature, scams are fundamental to cryptocurrencies in their current form. The crypto space does have a scammer problem, but you know what? So does tech, the medical field, and of course, Wall Street. It's a tale as old as money, and who knows what scams existed before then? Whether it's a woman founding a bank or a roadside snake oil salesman, Scams will always be there. The very first exchange in crypto history was a scam, a major fraud whose impacts ripple through to Bitcoin holders today. As long as there is money, the scammers will be fresh on the hunt. As a species, we're constantly striving for greater heights, seeking out the novel, and trying to secure a better life for ourselves and future generations. It's from this same striving that drives so much of our individual and societal accomplishments that this parasitic leeches of any sector take hold. We can learn from it and move on, Find a way to protect ourselves, develop tools that detect who to trust just like we always do in any new environment. There was a time when downloading your favorite songs for free would infect your computer with hundreds of thousands of high-risk viruses. Now you stream. We progress. But as a space, crypto folks should be figuring this out a lot faster. Anonymous, easy to access and replicate, and driven by speculation, everything people love about crypto undeniably makes it the perfect breeding ground for fraud. This is a reality that the space is going to have to embrace and figure out itself, or these guys will figure it out for us. If you liked this video, give us a like and subscribe for more educating and entertainment content. Thank you, everybody.